You know, as I was studying the text for today, I, a thought crossed my mind that we as Christians, we should be experts at, at waiting. I mean, we've been waiting for over 2,000 years, haven't we? And certainly in the context of what's going on in our world today, we're waiting for this thing to be over. The disciples uh, just went through Easter, the first resurrection six weeks ago. They've been with Jesus during this time. Uh, they've, he's been teaching them, and all kinds of things have been going on. The question is, so what do you do after the greatest event on the face of the planet happens? What are your next steps? Well, we're going to look at Acts chapter 1 and find out exactly what they did. We're going to be looking at the first 11 verses of Acts chapter 1, if you'll follow along with me. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So when I study a book, I, I look for patterns, repetition, <coughs> details about the book to get some background and, and to find out what the main themes are. And so I'd like to provide some of the facts about the book of Acts. Acts was written by Luke, do we know that? It's a continuation of the gospel of Luke named after him. And uh, it, uh, Luke, the book of Luke, talks about all that Jesus began to both do and teach. And that's what we see in verse 1 of Acts. Uh, it's written to Theophilus, just like Luke was. Theophilus, that name means lover of God or, or God lover. It doesn't really, it may not be to a specific person. Uh, some people say that it's not, except that in the book of Luke, he addresses most excellent Theophilus. That phrase means someone of prominence, someone of great wealth, status, importance. <coughs> Excuse me. There's a lot of speculation about Theophilus may have uh, commissioned Luke to write these books. Uh, he paid him to do it. This was what Luke was employed to do. There's also a lot of evidence that says that Theophilus supported Paul's ministry as well. He was his benefactor and uh, supported Luke and Paul. Acts as a book on the whole answers two questions for us. The first is, who was Paul? And the second was, how did the church, the Christian church, get from Jerusalem to Rome? Uh, when you think about it, what did the new church have going for it? They had no money. They had no place uh, to meet. They didn't have experienced uh, leadership. They had no technological tools to, uh, to, uh, to get the gospel news out. 
What did they have? Well, they did have a lot of obstacles. I mean, they had the fact that it was an utterly new religion with new ideas and thoughts and concepts to the, to the, uh, to the Jewish culture and society. Radical ideas. They taught truths that were incredible for the world to try to grasp and hold on to. And they also had an abundance of hatred and persecution. So how in the world did the, the first century church ever really make it in Israel, let alone get to other countries? But we know that it did, certainly. We don't know uh, as well a lot about Luke as the author. We know that he was a physician from Colossians 4.14. He was Paul's doctor. We know that uh, he was the only Gentile writer in the New Testament, in the, in the Bible. Uh, we know that because of his name. Uh, Luke is a Gentile name. And we know that he and the Apostle Paul were very close friends, good friends. We know that from the book of Acts. We know that from Philemon 24. Uh, and other areas in the New Testament. Now, some experts say that the book of Acts is the most historically accurate book ever written in the New Testament. Uh, its historical framework is exact, meaning the cultural and political and uh, people named, they all fall in line with what we know from external sources about the first century. There's some question as to whether Acts is a defense brief for Paul, who is on trial with Caesar Nero at the end of the book of Acts. Uh, it's, it's accuracy in its form and fashion, and that would also lead to why it was being commissioned by Theophilus to be run. If he were, for instance, a, a Roman attorney who happened to be a Christian or a God-fearing Jew, in Rome. He would want to know all of the things that transpired in a timely uh, manner, facts laid out, and, uh, and this book certainly uh, reads like a defense brief. So Luke shows through the book of Acts three things to Theophilus and to the Romans that, uh, uh, about Christianity. He shows them first that Christianity is harmless. As a matter of fact, there were a lot of Romans who became Christians, officials, prominent Romans. Uh, he shows them that Christianity is innocent. There are judges in Rome that found no basis for persecution or prosecution of Christianity. And the third thing is that Christianity was lawful. This was brilliant. In Rome, the official religion uh, well, uh, authorized religions, I should say. Uh, Jewish religion is one of them. Judaism is one of them. So Luke, in his book, lays out Christianity as the continuation of Judaism. So if Judaism is legal and authorized in Rome, therefore Christianity should be lawful as well because it is the natural growth of Judaism, development of Judaism. We know that Acts covers about 30 years from this point, the ascension of Jesus, to Paul waiting uh, for trial before Caesar Nero, which happens in 60 or 61 AD. And we also know that just a few years later, 64 AD, uh, Caesar Nero starts those infamous persecutions of the Christians in Rome in the Colosseums. Uh, and, and I think you need to hear this. This is important. It's amazing if you think about it. Acts really is the continuation of the work of Jesus. Now I know, when you read Acts, there's an awful lot in there about Peter and, and Paul, but it's really about the work that Jesus is doing. And in a real sense, the book of Acts is still being written today. Not in an authoritative scriptural sense, but certainly in the sense that God's work in the world, by His Spirit, through His church, continues today. Did you ever think about that? That means that you, as a disciple, as a believer, as a Christian, 
working in the world today, doing God's work and will, you are being written into the book of Acts as you do God's work today. We are in the book of Acts. Now I want to ask you, how productive are you like the week before you go on vacation? If you're like Sharon and I, then the week before we leave, we get all our ducks in a row. We, we set things up so all of our duties are covered. Uh, we, we line out all of the week's responsibilities, and not just the week's, but, but the time that we're going to be gone as well. Every I is dotted, every T is crossed. We make sure that everything is done. It's like our minds go into uh, hyperdrive, and they organize and prepare and complete everything so that while we are gone, we don't have a thing to worry about. We can be where we are instead of worrying about what's happening back home or at work. Now, if we look at verses 3 through 5, I want you to know that I don't think that's what's happening here with Jesus, giving last-minute commands to the disciples. In verses 3 through 5, he talks about his suffering, presenting them proof that he was alive. Uh, he appeared to them over a period of 40 days. It, 40 days is interesting too, isn't it? He started his earthly ministry with 40 days of temptation. He ends his earthly ministry with 40 days of triumph. That's another thing. That's for you new numbers people out there, you numerologists. Uh, and it says that he spoke about the kingdom of God. It talks about when he was eating one time with them, he gives them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that the Holy Spirit, my Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. John baptized with water, but in a few days, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's, it's not last minute details before you go on vacation. I think it's more like a teacher giving his students uh, responsibilities, assignments for summer break, or, or a parent saying, these are the chores that I want you to accomplish while I'm gone. Or maybe it's simply the most important things that you need to say to the people that you care the most about as you're getting ready to leave. He gives commands. He doesn't give suggestions or, or ideas or options. He tells them what they are to do. I like that. I like knowing where I stand with someone. And he finishes up with the disciples, giving them their favorite word, maybe your favorite word too. His, their favorite command is, wait. And of course, Peter says, oh, Jesus, you know what? We waited while you taught us for the last three and a half years. We waited while you prayed. And sometimes we took naps. We waited after they killed you for three days. We even waited on Sunday when the women told us that you had risen. We waited in Galilee for a while before we went fishing. So now you, you want us to wait again? Peter doesn't say that, does he? Could it be that, that Peter, impetuous, impulsive, unpredictable, never knowing what's going to come out of his mouth, when he's putting his foot in it, that Peter may have actually listened and learned something from Jesus over the past 40 days? I think so. And I think we'll learn more about those things as we study uh, later. But first, they have to wait. So what does the waiting mean for these men at this time? Well, they know that this waiting, it's going to be worth it. They know that they have just received a promise from Jesus, and that promise was going to be coming, that it would be fulfilled. They knew that uh, they must receive that promise. It's not something that they can create for themselves. It's a gift that they're being given, and they have to receive it. And they also understand that they would be tested in the waiting, at least a, a little. I ordered a gift a few weeks ago for my Mustang, Ruby. Okay, actually, the gift is for me, but it goes on the Mustang. Uh, I've been saving for it for quite a while. I researched it, looked at videos about how to install it, was really excited about getting it. I picked the perfect one for my car. 
uh, and Amazon promised that it was shipped and it was on its way. And then FedEx promised that it would be here on a specific day and I was so excited. And that day came and it didn't come that day. So you thought, oh, okay, the next day. The next day came and it still didn't come. I had to wait three days for my electronic fuel injection system for Ruby, my 68 Mustang. Broken promises. Those are two things that we really hate to do, aren't they? Sometimes we hate to wait and we hate broken promises. But sometimes God needs us to wait in order to learn and to be appreciative of the gifts that he has for us. We're doing that right now, aren't we? We know what the gifts are too. The fellowship with one another being able to come and go as we please, not having to wear a mask that fogs up your glasses when you're walking through Walmart at a safe distance from other carbon-based life forms. And broken promises. We get those all the time, every day. But this situation, Jesus commanded, the Father promised, and we know that the Holy Spirit was given. They always, always fulfill their promises. God's promises always come true. They come true because they're promises from the Father, and we know that they're going to be good promises. He always fulfills. He doesn't promise things that He's not going to fulfill. I, I was going to say can't fulfill, but He can fulfill any promise. They're just ones that wouldn't be for our best interest or for building the kingdom. The promises are from the Father, so they're for His children. The promises are from our Father, so therefore all His children. And those promises, as with all the promises in the Bible, they must be received by faith. Verse 6, Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So here it is. They ask their final question to Jesus. And, and in keeping with the vacation theme, this would be like uh, on your family vacations when your kids were little. Do you remember those? They, they uh, ask questions as soon as you prepare. Are, are we going to leave now? Then immediately when you get in the car, five minutes later maybe, are we there yet? When are we going to get there? How much longer? Are we lost? Are you going the right way? Do you even know? Oh, okay. Well, those last two were probably more from Sharon than they were from the kids. But you get my point. The disciples may not have known that this would be the last time that they would be with Jesus physically, that they would see him. But the question seems to suggest that they know something big is coming, that, that there's going to be an exciting ride coming in the next few days. Are we there yet? Lord, is this the time we've been waiting for? Now, to be sure, they've asked that question before, more than once. But now it's even more relevant. You see, Jesus instituted the new covenant in Luke 22:20, 20, and the disciples knew that. They were all there. And they also knew that part of the new covenant coming, being instituted, was the kingdom being restored. That's part of it. They got that from the Old Testament, from Jeremiah 23, 1 through 8, from Ezekiel 36, 16 through 30, from Ezekiel 37, 21 through 28. All that to say, this would have been a normal question to come up at this time. Now, it's interesting that the word restore speaks to political and territorial items. So the disciples were probably still relying too much on their former uh, earthly idea uh, uh, or their former ideas of, of earthly kingdoms rather than what Jesus was telling them uh, or had taught them over the past few uh, weeks. But it's interesting to see that Jesus still addresses their questions, not the inaccuracy of their question. In verse 7 and 8 he says to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, 
but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What if Jesus simply said, oh, no, guys, you see, that part, the, the restoring of the kingdom to Israel, that's not going to happen for at least 2,000 years from now. Can you imagine what the response of the disciples would be? How they would feel? Now, they'd stare at him for a few seconds as it settled in and sunk in. And then you would see their shoulders slump a little bit in disappointment. Their eyes would, would be downcast in maybe frustration, maybe desperation, disappointment, desperation, futility. Those emotions would settle in. All of this and Israel is not going to be taken care of for over 2,000 years. It would discourage them, I think, to the point where that, that it would affect the work that they had to do right now. Or, or it might make them think less of the kingdom of God that was present with them right now. So I think it was a smart thing for Jesus, a good thing for Jesus, to simply not give them those details. Now, I didn't say that it wasn't going to happen. He simply said to guess or speculate into the times and dates of, of God's plans are not for the disciples to get into. Can I tell you that's pretty good advice for us today? He simply said to guess or speculate into the times and dates of God's plans really aren't for the disciples to worry about, to get into. But then Jesus goes further, and what he does tell them is that you will have the tools, the power that you need to do what God wants you to do. What he did say is that you will be witnesses of me in all the world. And that wasn't a command, by the way. That was simply a statement of fact. He said, when the Spirit comes to you, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. The question that I ask there, and maybe you're asking it too, is, is that saying that we need the Holy Spirit in order to be witnesses for Jesus? Well, I don't know. But I will tell you this. A PhD in evangelism or advanced degrees in Jesus speak aren't anywhere near as effective in building the kingdom of God without the presence of the Holy Spirit. So the question may not be, do you need? But the question should be, why would you want to without the Holy Spirit? Verses 9 through 11. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So why did he leave this way, do you think? Over the last 40 days, he, he would just disappear and appear. I mean, in a locked room twice. Uh, to the disciples on the Emmaus Road, he disappeared when they were breaking bread. Why didn't he just do that at this point? Well, there's a reason. He disappeared, ascended this way, because he wanted the disciples to know that he was gone for good. He could have just vanished and reappeared in God's presence, just like he had done. But he needed them to understand this. I'm finished. My part is done. It's all up to you now. This is all yours. You take it from here. And also remember what he said in John 16, 7. He said, but I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So there are a couple reasons that he went away 
and a very good reason as to why he went away in the way that he did. And then, as you're looking at the scripture uh, in that final verse, 11, um, you get this classic picture of these disciples, these 11 men standing there, looking up intently at a cloud, staring, gazing. The angels appear and they say, what are you doing? you got work to do. And I love these words, these next words. They say, this same Jesus, isn't that great? You understand that, right? This same Jesus, this same Jesus that was with you just a few minutes ago, this same Jesus that, that made breakfast for you on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. This same Jesus who taught you for the last three and a half years. This same Jesus that walked with you. This same Jesus that prayed with you and prayed for you. This same Jesus of the Gospels. This same Jesus of, of love and grace and goodness and wisdom and care. This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven is seated right now at the right hand of God the Father. This same Jesus is there right now, disciples, seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding on your behalf. He's saying the same facts to you that he stated to those first disciples. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you. You will be my disciples, witnesses, rather, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And beloved, look to the south. Just a few miles away from where we are right now is the end of the earth. Okay, well, the Gulf of Mexico probably wasn't what Jesus had in mind when he said that. But can I tell you what he did have in mind? He, he did have Corpus Christi was in his mind. Living Word Church was in his mind. And you were in his mind. I was in his mind. Every believer today was in his mind when he said, when the Spirit comes to you, you will be my witnesses. So, beloved, we need to ask ourselves the same question the disciples asked back then. What now? The greatest thing on the planet has happened. What now, Lord? But as we move forward towards Pentecost and, and continue to study, we, we should pay close attention, Living Word Church, to what's happening to this first century church. Why? because we're in the same place as the first century church. We're just starting out. It's a very exciting time for us, just like it's a very exciting time for them. And God's plan, His vision for us, it's going to be unimaginable, incredible. It's going to be a wild ride. Let's pray. Lord, we would pray your blessing upon the word that we've been given today. And we would ask that one nugget of truth, one principle within your word would find its way into our hearts and into our minds and it would change us from the inside out. Maybe it's to be that witness that you spoke about in your word. Maybe, Lord, it's, it's to accept the baptism of of the Holy Spirit. We know today, now, because the Holy Spirit is here, that it, it really comes in the opposite direction. First, we're baptized by the Holy Spirit, and then we are baptized by water. But these men were baptized first by water, and then the Holy Spirit came. So maybe, Lord, it's a baptism. We've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and maybe now we need to proclaim it by water baptism. Maybe now, Lord, we need to take that baptism that we've received when the gift of the Holy Spirit was given to us and we need to access the power to be your witness. Father, whatever that nugget of truth is, we would ask that you would make it clear to us. 
so compelling that we can't sit still and we can't keep quiet about what you've done for us and what you want to do with those that are around us. We pray your blessing upon our church as we continue to move and to grow. We thank you for the growth. We thank you for the men and women that are finding their way to Living Word Church, to learn, to sit at your feet and be a disciple and be part of the fellowship and to, and to be actively involved in corporate and individual prayer, intercessory, intercessory prayer for each other and going before you as our Father. And Lord, as we continue to find creative ways to fellowship, we would pray that you would lift our spirits Allow us not to become discouraged. Allow us to understand that even though we are separate and apart and sometimes isolated, we are still part of this great fellowship of believers. So continue to grow us closer together as we draw close to you. Keep us strong and healthy this week, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. God bless you all. Be safe and be well.